This is indeed the last In The Call series. And we started this back in September. Um, and uh, we're going to finish this off. I was like, I am going to finish this off this year. Uh, and so we're going to do three hallmarks in one. Um, we'll come to that in a moment. But next week, we have a special Christmas service. And uh, we have both the St. Albans site and the Hatfield site together here. And AJ and Jenna and the team are going to be leading that. And I'd really encourage you to come along. It's going to be a wonderful time as we celebrate this Christmas uh, season together. And so Verso St. Albans and Verso Hatfield will be here together. And of course, Verso the Mount will be meeting uh, where they are at the Mount. Um, and uh, yeah, do come along to that. It's going to be very exciting. Um, as I mentioned last week, we start Alpha in January across all three of our sites. And uh, at Verso St. Albans, we start, uh, I believe it's January the 15th, but we are building up team as we speak. So if you would like to serve on Alpha, then you should be signing up. Uh, Andrew and Joanne Mills, the wonderful Andrew and Joanne Mills, are going to be here um, in between the services. They're coming to the 11.30, but you'll find them by the donuts. And if you would like a donut, then you have to sign up for Alpha. That's the new rule. I'm just saying, why not? Um, but no, Alpha is an amazing 10-week course, and we're specifically looking for anybody as well who has a, was it, level three cooking certificate thing uh, for the kitchen team. So uh, if you like being in the kitchen, uh, and if you uh, uh, are able to do that, why don't you to say, hey, I'm around, I'd love to, to serve. So um, do, do that, Alpha is a fantastic, uh, a fantastic course. Really excited that we get to run this across all three of our sites in January. Okay, well, let's kick off um, with um, the finale of the call. And um, we have been looking at the call of the disciples and specifically looking at the story uh, in Luke chapter 5, uh, 1 to 11, uh, where Jesus calls Simon Peter into the boat. And as way of a mini overview, in case you missed any of this, there's three calls within that story. The call to be with Jesus first, because we're called to someone before something, uh, the call to walk with Jesus, that's to be in the boat. Um, and uh, that's uh, then the call to fulfill the Great Commission. So those are really the three calls that we've been unpacking. And as it relates to the Great Commission, which is we have all been called to uh, make disciples of every nation, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is something that we are all called to do. And uh, what I loved about Claire, who spoke uh, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, she unpacked um, some different language for us, essentially saying the same thing, which is we're called to Christ, and from that place, he then commissions us to do the stuff. And I really like that way of thinking about it, which is that our, our stuff comes out of our relationship with Jesus. And oftentimes, we, we get so busy into doing the stuff, it gets higgledy-piggledy and the other way around. And for some of us, we think that we earn his love by doing stuff for him, and all of a sudden, we, we start manufacturing works when Jesus calls us to bear fruit. And they're very different things. So we've been looking at, within this story there, I said there are 10 hallmarks of the call to fulfill the Great Commission. And as way of a recap, let's look at the seven that we got up to. They're on the screen, if you can see that. God calls us at a point where we feel weak and tired, that we see that in this story. Number two, it will require us to go deeper than we did before. You know, Jesus says to Simon Peter, go out into the deep. Number three, it doesn't always seem to make sense to us when Jesus asked Simon Peter to put the nets out in the day. And he said, but hold on a minute, we fish at night, we're professional fishermen. And how often is it true in our lives that God calls us to something that in the natural doesn't seem to make sense? Um, number four, it requires obedience to his word. We get to this nevertheless moment. Simon said, well, listen, even though I'm a professional fisherman, nevertheless, I'll do what you say. And that, nevertheless, that obedience to his word is a doorway into his blessings where we see, number five, there is blessing in the call. Uh, we saw that the amount of fish they caught. Number six, the call comes with others, that he wasn't called to do it on his own. And number seven, he reveals himself to us and we respond in worship to him. There was this revelation that Simon Peter had that this was Jesus and he got on his knees and says, get away from me. I'm an unholy guy. And Jesus says, do not be afraid, stand up. And so last week, Eduardo, our worship pastor and myself, we unpacked what it looks like in our lives to worship God. And so for those of you who are good at maths, that leaves us three to get through today. So lock the doors. We're not leaving here until we get through these. So I think an hour a call mark will be fine. I'm just kidding. Why don't we look at hallmark number eight? 
And in order to do so, let's look at verse 9 together of our story that we've been um, diving into. And um, <clears throat> we read in verse 8, would help if I got the right chapter. There we go. <clears throat> right. But when Simon Peter saw it, this was the amount of fish, he fell down at Jesus' knees, and this is where we're catching up from last week, saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. For he and all who were with him were astonished. And this brings us to hallmark number eight, which is simply this. Its purpose, the call's purpose, is to lead others to bring glory to God. Now, this might sound a bit like, well, obviously, Mark, but let's just think about this. You see, the Great Commission is not about making us look great. Look what I did for so-and-so. Look how I showed hospitality. Look how I was able to bless people with this, that, and the other. I expect applaud, applauds. Applauds? Is that a word? I don't know. Who knows? You see... The, the moment here is that Simon Peter's friends didn't say, wow, Simon, you're an amazing fisherman. We've never been able to catch fish during the day, but here you are, and you've caught all this fish. This is not what happened in the story. You see, the signs and the wonders are signs pointing to Jesus and wonders about him. This wasn't about Simon Peter. You see, Simon Peter was the one that threw the net over, but the glory was given to Jesus Christ. And you see, this hallmark is really important because I think it scratches at something in our humanity, our fallen nature, where we really expect the glory to come to us, if we're really honest. Now, I know this is a safe place, so I'll be honest with you guys. There are moments I'm like, well, hold on, they should say thank you. Like, they should realize what I've done. You know, like I expect some, some more gratitude, some more this, that, and the other. I know none of you are like that, obviously. You're all very holy people. <laughs> but you see, in this moment, Simon Peter didn't say, well, hold on a minute, guys. I threw the net over. He was on his knees with the others in astonishment. And you see, the point of the call, when we fulfill the Great Commission, when we go and we preach Christ in word and deed, when we go and... Uh, love on somebody with a meal, when we go and check on our neighbors and see if they're okay and we pray for them, when we lead someone to Christ, when we do all of these things, when we pray for someone who's sick, our heart should be that they say, wow, isn't Jesus amazing? Because you see, the point of the call is it's all about Jesus. It's not actually about us. And I know that offends us really, you know, John Wimber, the founder of the vineyard, used to say that God offends the mind uh, to reveal the heart. It's a good phrase. We hear someone, oh, I don't know if I like that. Well, let's just have a look at where your heart's at with that then, shall we? What do you mean it's not about me? Oh, you mean I need to work on humility? Well, you, hashtag you can't work on humility. You just get on your knees and you worship Christ. If you work on humility, it's called false humility, and it's just a piece of pride, really. And so the point is this on hallmark number eight, and I'm, I'm only gonna touch on this briefly now and move on because we've got two others, is this. When you do something, pray, Lord, I just ask that in this moment, you would reveal yourself to them and they would be astonished at what you've done through me. That should be our prayer. Add that to your list of prayers as you go and fulfill the Great Commission because that is hallmark number eight. And we're going to move on to number nine, and it is this. We move on in the story. Isn't it amazing in this very short story all these hallmarks exist? God's Word is just so amazing. You know, um, uh, um, what's his name? Very famous preacher and pastor. Uh, I've had a blank. Never mind. He said this, soak in the Word. Soak in the Word. I've said this before. He said, soak in the Word. You know, often we're so used to just skimming through it or reading and go, oh, okay. But the more you soak, we've been soaking in this word for three months and God has revealed so much truth and there's been a thread 
that has weaved itself through this story and weaves itself throughout the rest of Scripture as well as we pulled in other parts of the, of the Word. And so as we, as we soak in his Scripture, I want to just give you this tip. Get one verse or two verses or a, a section and say, I'm going to just soak in this for one week. Don't, don't move on. I know we have daily readings and they're good and I don't want you to stop doing that if you do that. In addition to that, why don't you just pick a segment of Scripture and say, right, I'm going to soak in this for one week. See what God does. Ask the question, what have you got in this for me, Lord? And uh, there's another story of a, of a professor when he was teaching his students theology. And he would say, right, I want you to sit down. And in silence, we're going to spend an hour. And I want you to come up with, you know, three things that you can find from this Scripture. And after about, you know, five, ten minutes, they would be like, okay. And after the hour, he said, right, now I want you to do another hour and I want you to come up with 10 and 50. And the point he was trying to teach his students was that the more you soak in his word, the more that God reveals himself in that word. We're so used to snacking on content. You see, social media is rewiring our brains to only be able to scroll, snack, scroll, snack, scroll, scroll, snack. And scientists will tell you that it's actually rewiring our brains. And we have a whole generation coming up who have an inability to focus on something for a long period of time. Listen, technology is neutral, but the devil knows how to use it for his own purposes. We've got to be wise and stop snacking and get down into the word and the meat of the Lord's word here in the Bible. Anyway, that wasn't in my notes. You get that one for free. So bless you. Right, where were we? Hallmark number nine. Okay, Luke chapter five, verse four. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your net for a catch. Okay, we've gone backwards slightly here in the story. And this is really, you could, you could read this and, 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 and miss this. He says, put out into the deep and let down, listen to this, your nets for a catch. Let down your nets for a catch. Jesus didn't say, hey, I've got this shiny new net for you. He didn't say, here's some money, go buy a new net. He said, let down your net. Why? Because hallmark number nine is this. He calls us to use the gifts he has already given us. I love this. Jesus didn't say, your net was just faulty. You've got a really bad net. No, 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 no. Use your net. I've given you that net for a reason. Let me ask you a question. What net has God given you? What metaphorical gifting do you have that you've said, well, that's not good enough, that net, because it's only made for fishing at night? And I've looked at that. I said that in those days, they, they fished at night because they didn't have modern-day nylon. They used linen, and the, the fish would see the linen during the day. That's why they did that. Uh, and so Jesus is saying, use the existing net that I've given you in this new context. And for some of us, what we say is, well, my net isn't good enough for this point here. Lord, the gift you've given me, I wish I had their net. Their net is made of nylon. You're asking me to do this, that, and the other. Why didn't you ask them? There's a great scripture in 1 Peter 4.10. Let's look at this together. And it says, each of you has received a gift to use to serve others. Be good servants of God's various gifts of grace. Another word is gracelets. You know, gifts of grace, gifts to empower each of us to serve others. God's grace, I've said this before, doesn't cover up bad living. That's how we normally use grace. Well, God's grace is sufficient for you. You go on sinning. It's fine. God's grace is enough. God's grace isn't there to, carry, to cover over bad living. God's grace is there to empower right living. When Paul said, you know, Lord, the, the Lord had said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, what he was saying is, is that my empowerment for you is sufficient to walk through your trials and troubles and fulfill the call that I've laid on your life. That's what we talk about when we talk about God's grace. It is that he gives us that which we do not deserve and mercy is holding back that which we do. I'll say that again. God's mercy is holding back from us what we deserve and God's grace is giving us that which we don't deserve. 
And so you have been given gifts of grace in its various forms. And we looked at this a few weeks ago when we looked at one of the hallmarks that we've all been created uniquely and differently to fulfill a unique purpose. That we should swim in our own lane. Don't look at your neighbor next to you and say, oh man, I wish I was like them. Their gifts are amazing. Ask yourself this question this morning. What net do you have? Now, for some of you, it's a gift of hospitality. For some of you, it's, you, can, you have a spirit of discernment. You just, you know, you hear people and you can see beyond the flesh, so to speak. You can see what's going on in the spirit. For some of you, it's wisdom. God's given you this, you just seem to in these moments, God gives you this, this wisdom to be able to help people. Maybe it's a gift of empathy, like you're really empathetic towards people. Maybe it's a gift of, 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 of being an intercessory prayer. Maybe you, you get on your, whatever that gift is, what is your gift? That, maybe it's administration. What is the gift that God has given you? And I think for some of you, it's like the net has been bundled up in the corner of the boat and you look at it with almost disdain and say, well, I can't use that net. I tried once and I caught nothing. Disappointment can often stop us from responding to the call because what we really want from Jesus, if we're honest, is a new net. If we're really honest, we don't even like the net God's given us because we don't think it's fit for purpose. It's made of linen, Lord, and you want me to fish it in during the day? I don't think so. What net has Jesus given and what net is God asking you to pick up and throw out for his glory? We're going to have a time of ministry later, and, and, and I'm going to really be praying that God would be open. I think for some of you, your eyes are already open, and the Holy Spirit is, is opening your eyes to what those nets are in your life. What about that little boy in the Scriptures? You know, we've got the five, feeding of the 5,000. Talk about feeling of inadequacy. Jesus said to the disciples, hey, we've got to feed these people. And the disciples are like, well, there's no shops open at the moment. Well, there's no shops anyway. What are we going to do? Well, then there's boy. I've got some loaves and fishes. Excuse me? Have you seen how many people there are? You think these paltry, small amount of loaves and fishes are going to do the job? But you see, what happened was there was an act of faith an offering of what was in his hand. And what did God do? He took that and multiplied it. Not only did he multiply it, there was leftovers, 12 sackfuls. And so we look at our net and say it's not adequate. We look at the smallness in our hands. You see, God's not looking for your capability. He's looking for your availability. He's not looking for you to come up with the resources He's looking for you to offer what you have in your hand and he'll just magnify it and he'll multiply it for his glory. Why were they astonished? Because Jesus did something extraordinary. They caught fish during the day. Have you ever figured that maybe God wants to take your net that you might not think is adequate and do th something supernatural so that people will say, that's amazing. But that goes back to hallmark number eight. Seven. Which is Eight. I don't know. <laughs> His purpose is lead to others to bring glory to him. If that's our mindset, you say, I want to be a fool for Christ. I'll give it a go. I don't care if I fall fat on my face, it's fine. But listen, if your goals are not big enough, so big that if Jesus doesn't turn up, you'll fall flat on your face, then what kind of goals have you got? Where are we? Someone tell me which hallmark we're up to. Thank you. Right, good. Okay. That brings us to hallmark number. Hey, we're at 10. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <coughs> All right, here we go. John chapter 5. It's verse 10 to 11. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Mm -mm -mm. 
You're not going to be surprised by this, but it is this. Hallmark number 10. Sometimes we will have to leave it all. Sometimes we will have to leave it all. You know, the writer to Hebrews said in chapter 13, well, he didn't say in chapter 13. They made it chapter 13 after he'd written it, but you get my point. Hebrews 13, 16 says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. I know in my own life, in Steph and, and, um, and my life and our family, there have been seasons where God has called us to leave everything. I've talked before about dangerous prayers, prayers to pray that are very dangerous. One of them is like, Lord, do with me what you will, take me anywhere, I'll do anything. Don't pray that if you don't mean it. Steph and I prayed that and we meant it after we got married and within a short space of time, he sent us off to Australia and we left everything, family and, and all those things. And we just heard that call and it was a bit scary, but by the grace of God, he, he made it easy for us to do so. And then many times where I've left companies and started other ones, there's, there's been a sense of leaving something and even most recently, next year is my sixth year as the senior pastor of this church, and what a privilege it is to be so. But that call came to leave the previous company I had founded, and I left that behind. And we left that world and came into this world. And for some of you here, you know that God is calling you to leave something. For some of you here, you know God is calling you to leave your job. You're just too fearful to make that step. And I don't want to make light of, of that process. I'm not saying it should be easy. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that in that place of seeming difficulty, that's when God shows up when we walk in faith, not by sight. For some of you, I believe that God has called you to the nations in this place. And God is saying, I need you to leave this country. I've got something lined up for you, but you're just, there is something, I can't do that, Lord. And God is patiently just waiting for you to say yes to that call. I, as I was researching, uh, as a studying for, for this talk, uh, I came across a remarkable lady called Karen Watson, uh, who was a missionary. Let me just read this to you. In 2003, there was a lady called Karen Watson who lived in California, and she left her job she was working in the prison service and joined the Southern Baptist International Mission Board as a humanitarian aid coordinator in Iraq. And as the United States and Iraq edged into war, she worked in refugee camps in Jordan and Kuwait, living out of a suitcase, never having a permanent home. When the war wound down, she moved into Iraq coordinating efforts to distribute three million pounds of food, set up water purification systems and, and helping the Iraqi people build their lives again. One year later, after she started, on March the 15th, 2004, while investigating sites for future humanitarian relief efforts with four other aid workers, she and three of her colleagues died from a rocket-propelled grenade and gunfire attack while driving through the city of Mosul. She had one year, but she left everything. And before she died, this is what she wrote. She wrote this about the missionary heart. The missionary heart, she says, is to care more than some think is wise, risk more than some think is safe, dream more than some think is practical. Expect more than some think is possible. I was called not to comfort or success, but to obedience. There is no joy outside of knowing Jesus and serving him. Wow. I think as we end this series, this is rather the perfect quote to end on. Because when I read this and I heard about her story and the sacrifice she made, it struck me to say, what am I really living for? Am I living for the Great Commission? Am I living 
to make Jesus known and make him famous? Or am I living here for comfort? We've been singing about joy and it strikes me that she said there is no joy outside of knowing Jesus. That's what we've been saying. But also this, and serving him. I suspect that, and we can know by the scriptures, that it was a difficult journey for the disciples as they transitioned from fishing from men, from fish, sorry, to men. But I think it's safe to say they experienced more joy as they served Jesus and gave up everything for him than they ever did before, serving themselves and their comfort. Friends, as we arrive at the end of this series, I want to, I want to end where I started. When I started this, I said the Lord had given me a picture and impressed upon me the, um, the need for us to think about moving away from the splash park and into the deep. That the challenge for us in our Western culture is that we're so used to the splash park apparatus of fun and the sprinkles that we get that rather than say, right, now I need to move on from that into the deep, we ask Jesus for more apparatus for the splash park. Are you hearing me? But you see, if you're saying to me, Mark, but I'm a follower of Jesus, then I'm gonna have to say this to you, then you're a follower of Jesus into the deep. You see, discipleship isn't about saying yes to Jesus and then getting a ticket to heaven. Discipleship is about saying yes to Jesus receiving the passport that He gives you to access all areas in His kingdom and walking it throughout now before we get to heaven. But that takes a decision to go into the deep. That takes a decision to move away from the metaphorical splash park and dive into the ocean of faith. Because friends, there is joy in that place. There is joy in that place. There is astonishment at what Jesus will do. And as a body of believers here at Verso Vineyard Church, as we embark on our next chapter next year, next year represents a deep ocean of opportunity to make Christ known. And it's not about what are the staff and what is the pastor gonna do next year. It's about what are we all gonna collectively do outside of these four walls next year to make Christ known. It relies on each one of us to say yes to the call to go in the deep. With that, let us stand as I pray. Thank you, Jesus.